We are broadcasting. It's Thursday. Welcome everybody to the Not Your Average Investor Show Thursday edition. Are people rolling in? Do we see people rolling in? I don't see any attendees They're yet. They're rolling in in droves, man. It's like Walmart on Thanksgiving right now, man. People are like pushing people out of the way to get in. It's insane, man. Can you see that? I, I, I can't see that, but I can definitely imagine it, Greg. And you have a very vivid imagination and I appreciate that. <laughs> Virtually speaking, of course. Virtually. Virtually speaking. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome everybody. Well, I see it. I see a couple, a couple of the use here. We got Jake is in the house. We got Lee Bishop in the house. We got Marilyn Cotterman all the way from home. Sasa. <laughs> home of the manatees. Uh, the man. Mike, Mike Foster in the house. We, we, it's, it is, it is our crew is all up in here. I yeah. want to give Jake the award for the first comment. Every time we show up for one of our shows, he always drops a yo or a hey yo, or how you doing? Mm -hmm. Or does, I think he makes fun of you a lot too, which I thoroughly appreciate. So Jake, <laughs> you, you win the award for fastest comment and uh, we appreciate you being here, buddy. He does have, he does have a good branded comment with a yo. <laughs> right. Lee Bishop is in the house. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning to you, Lee Bishop, even though for us it's technically afternoon, but I don't know how you live, man. No big deal. Greg and I, Greg and I were running at six in the morning. So I feel like it's like the evening, right? These make for long days, long days, good days, incredibly awesome days, incredibly amazing days. But, but uh, yeah, we do get out there. And then, you know, Pablo and I have been running in the mornings on Tuesdays and Thursdays for what about, I don't know, four months now or so. Dude, yeah. We came out of the gates firing uh, as far as we, we run four miles. That's what, we, that's what we were doing. And then these last two months, man, or this last month, it's just been, it's been tough, man. It's been tough. We haven't completed the four-mile stretch for one reason, me, you, whatever it was. Who cares? But today was that day. We completed the four-mile stretch. In today life we did it, man. Today we were champions. I am uh, going live on Facebook here, so stay with me as I try to do two things at once. You know, this going live on Facebook thing is not that hard, Pablo. I do it all the time on the uh, walk and talk. I don't know if you were paying attention earlier, but I think you're just faking the funk because it's really not that hard. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I just have a very expressive face. <laughs> well, good morning. Good afternoon to all of you out there. Let us know how you're doing. Drop a comment there. Tell me how we're doing. Um, it's great to be here on a Thursday and we have an awesome show prepared for you guys. And with that, I will kick it off to my esteemed colleague who is about to do his thing. I'm going to do my thing while Lee Bishop is still in his PJs. I want to say welcome everybody to the Thursday edition of the Not Your Average Investor Show. Yes, I am working and my lips are getting better at not showing it, Lee. Thank you for that comment. You're always on the lip game there. I am your host, Pablo Gonzalez. Not to make it weird talking about my lips as you first arrive, but that <laughs> is what I do with my face. My co-host, who is the grand... Puba of Jacksonville <laughs> real estate, rental income property investing, the world famous Greg Cohen. Say hello, Greg. Hello, everybody. That's that's quite an introduction. Totally unprompted by you. I, I appreciate that. Hey, man. I'm I'm just I'm just trying to keep it original. I can't I can't I can't keep bringing the same funk every single week <laughs> after I start getting called out by it. Right. So I'm uh I start with a G. I go into some kind of alliteration. Puba came out somewhere in there. No big deal. No big deal. We I've been called worse. <laughs> all right as everybody knows this is the thursday edition where it's just a couple of buddies hanging out we've got our, our our usual attendees that we love hanging out with uh we called them out earlier but lee jake uh leo welcome back Marilyn, welcome back mike foster welcome back all of our all, all of our peeps aaron o'neill we've seen you in here a couple of times welcome back as well um as you all know thursdays is the purely, purely interactive show where we are going to show you a property. We are calling it a new thing this week and uh, I'm excited to announce it when we do it. We're going to go through whatever questions you have on the, on the property itself, what makes it unique, um, go through the numbers, make it really interactive. We want you to chime in. So the two ways to do that is in the chat. When you pop that thing up, it's going to automatically default to only speaking to panelists. So you need to go to that blue button in the chat and drop it down from all panelists and just say all panelists and attendees. That way everybody can talk to each other. We can all become friends here, not just with us. We don't want to hog up all the good friendship here. And second, you can hit that Q and A button, pop that open, 
that's the best place for you to put your questions so that I don't go cross-eyed trying to keep track of everything that's going on in the chat, the Facebook group, and the Q&A. And I put it in front of the Puba himself, Greg Cohen, to answer. And last but not least, next step from here is always go to the jwbwebclass.com. We have a, I don't think we've said this before, Greg, but we have a free investor packet in there, right? Like it's a breakdown of four different properties. It teaches you how to analyze it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and it'll help you make the calculations that you need. So super value add there, Greg, anything that I missed there? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of something that we haven't highlighted in the past, but this passive income information kit is really helpful. And, um, quite frankly, a terrible marketer because we've had it for a long time and I really haven't told you guys about it. So <laughs> I would highly encourage you to, to, to get your hands on it. It's free. Uh, what it does is it breaks down, obviously the investment, the turnkey investment it breaks down our business model, how we perform for clients. And then uh, one part of it actually breaks down client returns. You're able to see the reporting structure. And you know, one of the benefits of being in business for 15 years is we have 15 years of tracking uh, success for clients. And so you're able to see, kind of put yourself in the shoes of a client uh, and that experience. So would highly encourage you to do that. You can go to jwbwebclass.com um, and uh, get a great introduction. Yeah. Not to mention, it's got a slick new design, right? Ooh, watch out now. Yeah. It looks real pretty. So without further ado, this is it. We are going to talk the JWB property of the week working title. And uh, <laughs> is, that, is that Michael Buffer over there? I think I, I think I saw Michael in Buffer in this corner. Uh, <laughs> all right, Greg, you ready to break this thing down? Ready? To, you ready to go to twelve oh nine Mall Street with me? Yeah, twelve oh nine Mall Street. So that's what we're gonna do every week. I'm looking at our inventory. I'm gonna choose a property that I really believe would be a great investment for you if you're a current client. If you're thinking about investing, it's one to take a look at. Um, and if it's not the right time for you to invest, you're gonna really love this as well. Uh, because this is going to be a great learning opportunity. So every single week, we're going to break this down. Uh, this is going to be my recommended property of the week for you. And then um, I'm going to highlight something about it uh, that you may not know, you may not uh, be aware of. It might be a unique thing to that property or to JWB, but it's going to be something that's influential. That's going to help you make better decisions on how to add to your turnkey rental property portfolio. So without further ado, uh, there we go. And I, you know, I wanted to ask for some feedback from everybody in the audience where, you know, the screen sharing thing is something that it's, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to do to make sure everybody can see the numbers. If you guys are, are watching right now, can you let us know if this is something that you can see if the numbers are too small, we'll, we'll adjust on the way. Um, but we want to make sure this is, this is something that you guys can be a part of the entire time. So throw it in the chat. Let us know if, if the screen is big enough for you guys, or if we need to adjust. It says it's a bit small by Mike Foster. Okay, very it's small. cool. Okay, so let's uh, let's do a little something right here. One twenty-five. Let's see how that Lee goes. said it looks great on the screen. Joe said it's a little bit blurry. So I think we we zoom in a little bit there. It'll be okay. All right. Yeah. Well, Lee, you know, Lee, I heard that Lee can see really well when he's wearing his pajamas uh, in the middle of the in middle of a Thursday afternoon. So that's that's a good one for Lee. Um, so Greg, the first thing I see when I look at this property is the last couple of properties we've shown here have been more than one story, right? Like whether it was a new home or it was a town home, is there any, is there any rhyme or reason to having more than one story in a home or not for a rental? More than one story. It's funny when you were saying that I was thinking more, more than one like story behind the property. So that's where I was gearing my mind to go. You're talking about vertically, like more than one story. Correct. There is more than one level. You are, you are a good marketer if you think it's stories, Greg. Congrats. It's all, I operate in stories. Um, so uh, no, to the question of does it need to be two stories or one story? It, it doesn't matter. The, the most important thing is positive cash flow when you're investing in rental properties. That's the number one rule of positive cash flow. If you can get it in a two story house or a one story house, that's great. Uh, so you're gonna see one story, you're gonna see two story from JWB. Um, whether we build them or renovate them, there's really no rhyme or reason. Um, many times the reason we decide to build either a two story or a one story depends on the lot that we have and there are zoning requirements and setbacks that allow uh, basically make your decision as to what kind of footprint you can put on the lot. Um, and you need to get a certain amount of square footage. If you have a really small house on a, sm or a small lot and a small, you need a small floor plan, but you want to get space and bedrooms and all that, you go vertical. It's, that's kind of how we do that. But no, it shouldn't matter uh, one way or the other for you guys. Okay. Maybe uneducated question. Maybe, I don't know. Just throwing it out there. The next thing I see is- But you need to have a lot of stories. 
like actual <laughs> stories for the house. Well, it the is more stories, the better. <laughs> the, more st- the more stories to tell, the better. All right, I got a story for you to tell. Normally, when I see these single family home residences that you've been showing, I've been seeing like townhomes in like the 150 range and single family homes in the 200 range, right? Like 199 ish. This is 168, right? So it seems, seems, like seems like a low price uh, for a spacious, uh, you know, bigger size home. What's, what's, the story, what's the story behind the price here? The story, might you ask, uh, this is a little bit of a call it an in betweener, all right? We normally have new construction properties. And typically new construction properties will be somewhere around 180, maybe closer to $200,000, right? And then we have renovated homes, which generally are a little bit uh, lower cost, right? It might be somewhere 150 to kind of maybe 180 is kind of your, your renovated properties. Both are great. We love them both, right? Because they both generate positive cash flow and hit our nine to 11% return requirements. Um, but this is a little bit of an in-betweener because when you look at that home, you might be thinking it, maybe it's, it's new construction or at least newer construction. This one was actually built in 2008. So it's not, it is a renovation for us, but it's a newer property. Um, and what that means, and it's also a, a large home, you know, 1700 square feet is what this home is. That's a little bit more than what I would say is normal. Um, and so what you're able to get again, are really strong cash flows and returns. You can see here, uh, 10.72% estimated return on investment just from the cash flows, not including home price appreciation. And that's really high. Our returns are between nine to 11% estimated. And that's, that's really the number one reason why I brought this to you all. Um, you're getting close to 11%. And then the purchase price here is a little bit on the lower side of new construction, a little bit on the higher side of renovations. You know, 168 is kind of in that kind of tweener phase there. So I thought it'd be a pretty cool opportunity for people to see what, what you know, we've, we've talked a lot about townhomes. We've talked a lot about new construction. We've talked a lot about renovations. And this is somewhere in between that new construction and renovation kind of price point um, and still delivers the rents and the returns that you need. Excellent. Talk to me about the neighborhood that this thing's in. Is this Mole Street? Actually, you know what? First of all, let's, let's answer Lee's, Lee's question. Lee, is, Lee has found something here in, in, the, in the spot, the difference game. Uh, why the fence? Is there something in the yard that is not available on other houses? Or is this just a matter of since it's renovated, there was a fence, now there's a fence there? You know, I'm not really sure if there was a fence there before, if we put one in during the renovation, sometimes we make that call. It's really just neighborhood specific. We'll make the call based on our experience. Um, You know, like for example, if you have a turnkey rental property and it's on a busier street, you know, that's an example where we're probably gonna spend the money. It's probably a good return on your investment for us to spend the money to put a fence in because we're we're renting largely to families and these are three and four bedroom homes. And, you know, families, and we also are, 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 we are, was it pet? Oh man, we have a term. We're pet friendly. Goodness. Must be losing my mind in my old age. We're pet friendly. Um, so, you know, a fence, especially if you're on a busier road, makes sense. It makes a lot of sense to that renter. There's a huge value for it. Do you need a fence in every single property? Absolutely not. I don't know what the percentage of fences I have in my own portfolio, but it's not overwhelming. Um, so it's a kind of a gut call and a feel call based on the neighborhood and what, what we have been able to achieve as far as rents in that neighborhood with a fence or without a fence. What have our days on market been for those homes that we've been renting out with a fence or without a fence? And so you can get the benefit of kind of learning of that over 3,500 homes that we manage over doing this for 15 years. And that's how, you know, we'll, we'll make that call uh, for you. Got it. Got it. Full disclosure, a dog barked at Greg this morning while he walked by. So he's a little, he's a little off on his pet, pet friendliness, but he means well. It's not like pet friendly was like this like revolutionary term that like I, I needed to like pull from the annals of my brain, but whatever, you know. I, know. I, was, I was underwhelmed with the term that you could, that you, that you, <laughs> I was thinking we were, yeah, whatever. Right. On to the next one. Uh, Mike, yeah, Mike Foster brings up a good point. One floor is desirable for elderly renters. That's, that's totally accurate, right, Mike? He also has a question. On average, what is the typical square footage and acreage of JWB homes? Ballpark. So for new construction homes, it's going to be somewhere around 1,200 to maybe 1,700 square feet is going to be the square footage. Um, the, you know, for renovations, man, could, could be anywhere. Uh, could be as little as maybe 800 square feet 
could be as high as, you know, 2,200 square feet, you know, uh, much bigger range because you obviously have less control of whatever was built before you got there. Right. Uh, but yeah, so for the, for the homes that we're building, which is about 400 homes this year, you're going to find them generally between 1,200 and 1,700 square feet. Okay. So right in that, right in that upper, right in that upper range of, of rental, right? So within that sweet spot that you guys dominate, mm -hmm. let's talk neighborhood, right? Is this, is this in one of these houses that's in a, in a neighborhood that you dominate? Absolutely. That's one of the reasons, again, why I brought it to you, because the biggest thing that we can provide for you as, in this asset class is consistency. That's the thing that most people are not getting from the stock market. That's the reason that they want to pull some of their assets from what may be viewed as more traditional assets, like the stock market that tend to go up and down and you have to watch the stock ticker. Well, if you can come to an asset class like rental properties uh, and per, you can earn consistency, that's a huge value to people. That's not what they're getting elsewhere. Well, the best way to produce consistency for you is to do the same thing over and over and over again. So if you've been paying attention to our Thursday calls, you've seen me talk about other examples in Arlington, right? That's if you remember Dandy, Coco Avenue, kind of India, you know, these are some of the streets there in that kind of Arlington neighborhood where I share with you, that's the place of, that's the birthplace of Bill to Rent, right? Well, and as we're kind of transitioning here, you can kind of see on the map here. Well, if I, if I continue that thought in Arlington, what I showed you is that for the property that we, we highlighted, there were like 30 or 40 or 50 other properties that we had managed uh, we had built, renovated, and now managed in that area. And that's how we know exactly what it's going to rent for. We know exactly what it's going to appraise for. We know what it's going to sell for. And it's a repeatable process. Um, so that was in Arlington. This is on the west side of Jacksonville, another one of our stomping ground neighborhoods. And so if you're looking at this map, we kind of pulled this. You know, this, what is that? Is that like a green dot in the middle there, Pablo? Help me it with is. the color there. It's, it's like a light green dot with uh, blue dots around it. There we go. Colorblind guy right here. Um, so yeah, so you're, you're, that dot right there is Mall Street. That's 1209 Mall Street. You're looking at a zoomed in version of a part of the west side of Jacksonville. The zip code is 32205. If you want to do your own due diligence, kind of follow along on your computer there and type in 1209 Mall Street, you'll, you'll kind of see this. But all of those other little dots right there are homes that we've either built or renovated and sold to clients and do the management for them. So when folks ask us, you know, how do you set the rent rates? Well, it should be really obvious how we sent the rent rates. I mean, there's probably, there's probably 30 homes just on Mole Street, Pangola, Neva, right there. I just counted those? about, I just counted about a little over 30 in this little square right here. Awesome. Awesome. So you got 30 that we've done over the last few years or whenever you got probably 50 within a half mile to a mile radius. Uh, and these are all the same type of price points, the same type of rents. You know, we ask whether a fence is necessary or not. Well, there's 30 to 50 data points right there that we know exactly what's going to be able to rent out for. Um, so you combine this, obviously, the, the, the rate of return is high and the consistency that we can bring by doing the same thing over and over again. I think this is a great example of how when you're making a decision for your turnkey rental property, it should have this type of track record. It should have these types of call it rental comparables that you can rely on to know that the rent that you expect is really going to happen. And that's, that's obviously what we're able to do here with the house on mall. Love it. All right. Now, Roger Evans has a question. How do you determine when to replace the roof on a renovation property? So, you know, for renovations, we're going to have kind of, kind of standards for different parts of the renovation process. For the roof, it needs to have at least 10 years of life left on the roof. And so for us, if there, you know, you can obviously pull permits and records to see when roofs are replaced. So you can get a little bit of that information when we're going through the due diligence on it, when we purchase it. But a lot of times it's not that clear, right? It could have just had a new roof put on five years ago, which you would think that there's at least 10 years of life left on it, but maybe something happened. Um, so we actually get out there. We actually get on the roof and it's not just us. It is the roofing contractors that we work with. And so what happens is if there's ever a question as to whether or not the roof needs to be replaced, the first thing is that that roofing contractor knows they're getting the work from us because they've, they've been a part of our network of uh, vendors. They know exactly what the pricing is and they know that we need to do that if it's going to be, uh, if it has less than 10 years of life left on the roof. So they're incentivized to tell us, 
that it needs to be a new roof. Um, if they tell us that there is at least 10 years of life left on the roof, they, they put their name uh, and their company name behind it. And they give you what's called a life letter. And that means that they have personally inspected it and they have uh, established that there's at least 10 years of life left on the roof. Um, and if they have that, then there won't be a roof replacement by JWB. If it's anything less than that, then that's going to be a roof replaced for you um, during the renovation. Got it. Lee has a, another question here. Lee Bishop asks, I see the maintenance rate is six, so a little higher than new builds, but it is 10 plus years old. So when do you do a remodel or rehab? So, so when you do a remodel or rehab, are you not replacing bathrooms and kitchen? So this is over 10 years old. That's great. The 6% maintenance rate really doesn't, it's not reflective of what this specific property is. You know, the way that we get that 6% rate is based on the 2000 plus properties that we have managed over the last 15 years and have understood exactly what on average your maintenance costs are for a renovated home. So there's this incredible amount of data that over time you're going to see the same type of maintenance cost. So it's, it's a, it's a great planning tool for you and it's factored into your return. So that's how we get there. The other question though is, you know, when do we make the decision to repair bathrooms or kitchens or whatnot? You know, generally speaking, when we renovate the home right off the bat, you know, we're spending on average over $40,000 into the renovation. And, you know, I'm not much of a contractor, I can tell you that, but it's hard to spend over $40,000 on a house that might be 1,200, 1,500 square feet without redoing almost everything in the house. You're talking about the major mechanicals, you're talking about, you know, kitchens and baths and whatnot. So many times the initial renovation is where we're doing a lot of the major work. And we do that for a reason, because if we do a good job there, we don't give you what's called deferred maintenance, which means future problems, future costs that you would need to incur later on, right? We want to incur that while it's hitting JWB's books, right? The bigger the renovation is in the beginning, that's, that's coming out of JWB's pocket. We want that because if we can do a good job there, it's going to limit your maintenance costs going forward. So it would be really unique that like the first turn, the second turn, the third turn of a tenant that we would need to go in and redo a kitchen or redo a bath. If that was to happen, that would be a big expense to you, uh, which would end up hurting us both. Because as we do this reporting on a monthly basis, we're comparing your estimated rates of return versus your actuals. We're comparing what that 6% estimated maintenance costs to you and then what actually is, is happening if we didn't do a good job on the renovation up front and we had to repair kitchens and baths during the turn, there's no way we would be able to hit that 6% maintenance number. Um, so it's very, very rare that we would do that type of major work that we would have to do that type of major work on a turn. Got it. Great answer. I got a, I got a great question here from Ben Jimenez. He asks concerning purchasing a rental at a place with 30 other rentals in that area. Would you not agree that means more competition to rent your home since having, you know, 10 homes for rent in a certain area? Well, so I'll share with, and it's Ben that asked the question, right? Yeah, Ben Jimenez. Ben, thank you so much for the question. So so many times when folks ask questions, so many other people are, asked, are thinking the same thing. So I really appreciate it. I'll share with you, Ben, there's a lot more than 30 or 50 homes for rent in that area. <laughs> These are just the ones that JWB manages. Um, but I would actually counter the, the concern that you have, you know, we're going to be investing in neighborhoods. You really should be excited to invest in neighborhoods with significant rental demand. That's why this works, right? You need to be investing in neighborhoods that are below middle income that have more rental demand than owner demand. And the reason there is because if you have more rent or demand, that means that your rent to price ratio is more advantageous. And a rent to price ratio is important because that's one of the biggest contributors to positive cash flow. So Ben, the alternative would be if you were investing in a neighborhood that had very few rental homes, then the, your purchase prices are going to be so high and the rents that you can command in that area are going to be low. Another way of saying those types of neighborhoods is middle income to above middle income neighborhoods. That's what happens. Your purchase prices go up because so many people are owning and not that many people are renting. So your demand for rentals is, is down. So, 
you know, your question about would I be concerned about investing in a neighborhood that had 30 or 50 other rental properties in a small area? Absolutely not. I would look to that as being one reason why I, I wanted to invest there. Now, the, 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 the level that you don't want to go to too far is you don't want to go to a low income neighborhood. Low income is where you're going to have even more rental demand, right? Everybody rents in a low income neighborhood. You got to work with a partner that knows the difference between below middle income and low income. So that below middle income with significant rental demand is actually where you want to be. That's a great question. That's a great answer, Greg. I also think that I would be remiss if I didn't also prompt you to talk about your marketing strategy to fill it with renters, right? Like I, like I think there is also an advantage in the fact that JWB is a marketing machine with a huge funnel of rental demand that's happening as well. So I don't know if you want to hit on that a little bit too. Yeah. I mean the numbers, the, just the funnel of new potential residents coming through JWB that, that crank out 25 or 30 new residents moved in every single month is unbelievable. Um, in June, I, I pulled the stats. We had over 5,700 new people apply to go and see a showing at one of JWB's rental homes. You know, from there, we had, we get 400 some odd showings a week of people actually attending those showings. And then from there, we convert about 6% of those into rented homes. And so there's this tremendous kind of marketing machine that is really scalable that only takes, you know, call it five to 10 leasing agents for us to handle. I mean, what other property management company can handle 6,000 leads with five to 10 leasing agents? Like it just doesn't happen. And we have to be good at that because that's the only way we're not just going to fill your home, but we make it really hard on ourselves because we only sign two and three year leases. Because at the end of the day, for you investing, the only way to hit those low maintenance and vacancy numbers is to have long-term tenant stays. So we, as a property management company, need to be really good at signing long-term leases and renewing those leases. And the only way that we're gonna be able to fill the right amount of residents in our homes is to talk to literally thousands of them. Because most other property management companies only sign one-year leases. One-year leases is like a turnkey rental strategy <laughs> based on hope. <laughs> I don't like to base it on hope. You're just hoping that they sign up for one year and you're hoping that they renew two years, three years, four years, right? You would much rather have a strategy that is harder on the property management company up front to sign two and three year leases. And then you can have those three, four, five year tenant stays. Um, but none of that is possible unless you talk to literally thousands of potential residents. So you got to have the systemization behind it. That's where most property management companies just a lot of property management companies are accidental real estate. They're accidental property managers. They were real estate agents and uh, they're just not built with the systems behind it to be able to handle that type of scale. Awesome. I just did something funny here um, <laughs> where I gave somebody access to speak, but give me one second. I got to change that. All right. Rick Williams. Sorry about that. If, if that was confusing, I just pushed the button. Um, well said, Greg, I had that fresh on the dome cause I was looking at, as you guys may or may not know, I write the copy for the social media posts that, that we put out there. And we had just put out on the JWB Facebook page and LinkedIn page, um, the one about all the, the thousands of people that we have in. And I was particularly proud of that copy because I made it into a knock doc joke. Anyways, that's just, <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Marilyn Cotterman asks, I am curious about potential exit strategy as I am retired. Do you have a number of for your clients who have exited around 10 years, 20 years and 30 years? Like, is there, do you have like a, like an understanding of like the percentage of clients that, that sell their rental income property around those times? Well, we've been in business for 15, so I don't have any clients that have been with us for 20 or 30 yet. <laughs> Just in 15 years, I'll, I'll have all the data on the 30, 30 year uh, holds. Um, but you know, we spend a lot of time on the front end, especially if any of you have spoken with our sales team, one of the first questions we're going to ask you is what's your, what's your hold mentality? Um, to the point where if, if you share with us that you're not sure if you want to hold on for at least five years, we're probably going to let you know that, you know, it's, it just doesn't seem like it's the right fit because this model, the way to benefit from cash flow, the way to benefit from home price appreciation is to buy and hold. So 
All that being said is we go really strong, especially on our calls here, talking about the value of holding. That attracts people to our clientele who want to hold. So very few people buy and sell less than five years. I don't know the numbers, but it is, is a really small percentage. It would only be those people that really kind of had like a life event that happened, um, which, you know, we have, you know, we have over 1200 clients now. So sometimes that does happen. So almost nobody sells before five years. Um, now what I really tell people to hold on to is a full market cycle. And the reason is Pablo, do you know why I go so strong, so strong with a full market cycle? Yeah, I happen to because I've heard you say it once or twice here because as long as that you're holding for a full market cycle, you can bank on that 4.3% appreciation rate, which is what's been happening ever since well before the Great Recession and all these other things. Nailed it, brother. Nailed it. So yeah, that's right. right? The reason, if you think about your decision to go invest in Cleveland, Memphis, Kansas City, you go to any of those other markets and you look at the potential return on investment just from cash flow, those other markets are going to be slightly better than Jacksonville. You're going to see slightly higher rents for that same $168,000 purchase, right? So the question would be, why would you come to Jacksonville then? Obviously, on this, you know, the team is the real reason, but many people don't know JWB yet. And it's, you know, everybody says their team is the best. So I, I, I understand that. But the, the, the reason that you can't deny is that you have to be a believer in the long-term growth of Jacksonville. And you have to be a believer that it is better than what you can get in Cleveland. And the numbers dictate that. So what Pablo is talking about is in Cleveland, if you look back since 1991, the home price appreciation rate on average is a little bit more than 2%. If you look at that same data in Jacksonville, the home price appreciation rate on average each year is 4.3%. So it's almost almost double. And that's really impactful. But here's the thing. You can't base your strategy on that unless you're in for a full market cycle. So if you're only into this for two years or three years, I want you to erase everything I just said from your, from your memory, because you should not be looking at home price appreciation as a reason to invest because you can't bank on what's going to happen in the next two years. And because you're going to get eaten up in costs to sell it. You know, even if it's five years, I don't think you count on home price appreciation then because it's not enough time. A full market cycle is known to be between 10 to 20 years. And that's when history repeats itself. If you go back from 2001 all the way to 2020, the data supports this. Even though we had the great recession in 2008 and prices dropped over 35%. If you look from 2001 all the way to 2020, we're still appreciating at an average rate of over 4% but you gotta be in for the long haul. So that 10 to 20 year segment of people holding on right now, many people are in that strategy right now and are holding on. We have many clients who are over 10 years holding on. I would, know, I would expect that percentage to continue to grow and grow and grow. There are some clients that sell between five to 10 years. You know, that's, that's kind of, we, we limit it. You know, if you don't have at least a buy and hold strategy of five years, we're, not, we're probably not gonna be able to work with you. If you're between five to 10 years, we're certain we're gonna, we're gonna love having you as a client. But I'll tell you, don't bank on home price appreciation. If you, if you, if you plan to hold for 10 to 20, then you can. Um, so I don't have a whole lot of data numbers to support, like which clients sell at which percentage, but the vast majority are still holding on after 10 years and they're in that cycle right now. Okay. Um, you said you don't have a lot of data, right? But like, who is the, what's, what's the profile of someone, someone that's looking at this for like five to 10 years, what, how does that make sense? Is that someone that's uh, close to retirement? Is that someone that's young and just is trying to make a quick move? Like, is there, is there any rhyme or reason to that? There's usually not a whole lot of people that are like, hey, I'm gonna go into this turnkey asset. I'm gonna hold on for seven years. I'm gonna hold on for eight years. It's usually like, hey, I know I wanna hold on for at least five. I'm gonna play it by year after that yeah. point. Yeah. You know, it's like, a not everybody needs to be committed and say, hey, 100%, I'm gonna to commit to holding on for 10 years. It just doesn't work with some people's life at that moment. Um, so that's more of what it is. It's just, they don't need to commit to that. Yeah. We just try to put the bug in their ear that, listen, the best return on your investment, the best experience that you're gonna have is probably getting that mindset of, of 10 to 20. And that's, that's kind of how we guide folks. Yeah, that was my, my guess is that it was like a mindset thing. Cause I remember when I was, you know, like seven years ago, private lending with you guys and thinking, do I, 
do I buy a house? I was just thinking, well, what if I want to buy my own home or something like that? And it was just like me speaking to myself inside my own head. But uh, you know, anyways, all right, we got, we got better questions than mine right now coming in. Roger Evans asks, I have observed a few of JWB's renovated properties with carpet. Why does JWB not upgrade to hardwood flooring and tile as carpets have a very limited lifespan, especially with possibly animals and residency traffic? I'd be interested to see the ones that you're talking about, Roger, because that's actually, we, we put um, luxury vinyl plank flooring in or tile, sometimes hardwood, but usually the luxury vinyl plank flooring, uh, which is a hard surface. We put that in all of our uh, renovations and all of our new construction. We've done this, geez, probably since, I don't know, 2014 or so. We made the move to do that. So uh, yeah, for anything that's purchased, geez, since 2014, I would imagine that you saw, um, you know, a hard, a hard surface, either a tile, luxury vinyl plank, or maybe even hardwood. Okay, good clarification. Mike Foster asks, speaking of long-term, with a hopeful economic recovery in a year or so, the potential of a greater percentage of millennials and others buying instead of renting, do you anticipate there would be a negative impact to the number of available good renters to fill all JWB investment properties? And does JWB sell properties for buyers' primary home to live? Um, I'll take the last one first. Do we work for, uh, do we take residents and help them buy their first primary home? I think that was the, the last end of the end of the question. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in theory, we would love to, and we're going to be supportive for the resident if they would like to be able to do that. We, we have dabbled in the past with putting programs together to help residents do that. And it just never worked out well. <laughs> there was just not a whole lot of residents that took us up on it and not a whole lot of residents that actually got to that step of being able to buy their homes. So in theory, we're very supportive of it. We would love for people to be able to buy their own home. We're big proponents of it, but we also recognize that many people like to rent. Um, and even greater than that, the percentage of people who are renting today compared to where it was a decade ago or two decades ago is, is the, the home ownership rate is, is way down. It's in the 60s and it was near, I think it was 69% was the highest that we had, you know, sometime in the past. And I think it was like 64, 65% a few years ago. And I'm sure it's gone up a little bit since then. But anyways, we're, we're way down as far as home ownership rates because of the Great Recession and a few other things. So, um, no, we don't, we don't uh, specifically go and help residents and put those classes together anymore. It just didn't seem to be a good use and it wasn't really valued by the residents. Um, and then the, uh, do we get, are we concerned about not having enough potential rent renters to fill our homes? No, hasn't crossed my mind. Um, you know, there's a lot of things in the here and now that are leading towards a lack of supply of housing. And I think that's the greatest impact on, you know, how does the, the balance work between supply and demand for renting homes and how does the buy, the balance work for supply and demand for buying homes Right now, for both of those, there's an extreme lack of inventory out there. And that's going to be that way for a long time. We're just now getting to the point where we're building enough housing units across the country to support new household formations. But we stopped doing that almost completely since 2008, 2009. And then since then, it has been a really slow ramp up of, you know, 10 years of under building. And it's going to take a long time to build up enough units to be able to have that balance. This is why you're seeing rents, rent prices go up. This is why you're seeing home prices go up. It's because of the lack of inventory overall. So I'm not concerned about the effect of uh, millennials on this at this point. I just think there's, there's such a lack of housing shortage right now. And that's the big driver of, of rents. Yeah. So simply said, the supply is so short that there would have to be a huge, huge increase in the demand for it to, or decrease in the demand for, for it to make a difference. I was an economics major, just that way. Yeah. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, we've got two more questions left and I want to pull in William Oxley's question from the Facebook group, right? Anybody that doesn't know, we have an awesome Facebook group. It's got 16, 1600 people now. That's right. We hit 1600 this week. 
And, uh, and that is where we interact throughout the week. We encourage everybody that's on this call for the first time. If we haven't joined yet, join us in there. Greg goes live in there almost every single day. We interact with people. We host watch parties. All of our content is there. It's, it's easy to find. You go to jwbfacebookgroup.com. I would highly, highly encourage you to join. But question from the Facebook group from William Oxley. I want to invest in rentals for my retirement and pass it down to my daughter one day when it's time to go. Awesome. Can I use my 401k for a down payment on my first rental property? So there are a lot of really great potential solutions to this. I love that Bill posted this in the, in the group. I hope he's on the call right now. He said he was going to be, oh man, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to give him the business on that. Um, He told me he was jumping on. So, um, so yeah, so there's a lot of things. If you're thinking about making an, an investment in your turnkey rental property portfolio and you have a company 401k or you have an IRA that is not affiliated with your company, there's a lot that you can do. Um, specifically, let's say the, the more restricted way to go about it is if you have money in your company 401k. So you're currently an employer or you're an employee at your company and you've been you know contributing, the company's been matching, you've got a nice... Uh, a a, a nice uh, balance there in your company 401k. Well, even prior to COVID, you can do something called a loan from your 401k. It's something that I do personally. I think it's a great thing. If you have another investment opportunity out there, it's a great way for you to basically take some of your retirement account money and diversify it into a different asset. And so here's how it works with, with my own company 401k plan. It allows me to borrow up to 50% of the balance of my 401k and to take that money out. And then what happens is I have to pay myself, my Greg, the person has to make small interest payments to Greg's 401k plan. So it's a loan from my 401k to me as the individual. I make payments back to my 401k plan. So it comes out of my paycheck every single two weeks, right? And then that goes back and then I pay it off over a number of years. Now in my company 401k plan, this is very similar. There's two types of loans. You can make a loan based on a a house purchase. Usually, typically this is only for a primary home and the terms are even more advantageous. They may give you longer than five years to pay it back, longer than maybe even 10 years to pay it back. Um, And then there's another loan that doesn't have any restrictions on where you're going to to put that money. Um, So for me, what I do is I borrow money against my company 401k plan. I then use that to make investments. And so, Bill, to answer your question, you could do the same thing, right? You probably, depending on your your company 401k plan, you got to look to see if they have the ability to do a loan from your 401k. Almost every 401k plan allows you to do that. And then you got to see if there's a possibility for you to get even more advantageous terms if you're if you're going to be using it to buy. Um, a turnkey investment property. It might even be more advantageous for me. It's a five-year payback. And then I can't remember what the interest rate is that I pay to myself. It might be 4% or 5% or something like that. So that might be one strategy that you can use. You can then get the down payment. I just literally get a check and put it into my personal bank account. And then I can use that however I want to invest. What I would caution people to do is to not go off the rails and do this. If you don't have a good investment opportunity, do not do this so you can go and go on vacation or to, to, do, to put your money to something that depreciates <laughs> or has no long-term value, right? But if you have a good investment opportunity, and if you're also feeling like you have too much money in the stock market, which is typically what you can only invest your company 401k plan in, this is a great way to diversify uh, and get out there. So that's the first thing. Uh, now with COVID, there are even more relaxed rules as far as pulling money out of your company 401k plan. I would just encourage you to do a little research on that. Uh, There's less restrictions with taking loans from your company 401k plan now. And this was passed by Congress to make sure that people had the ability to survive in these hard times that they had a lot of money uh, locked up there. So a couple of things there. Now, if you're not in a company 401k plan, if you've got a self, if you've got an IRA that is not affiliated with your company, then you can invest uh, in rental properties with no restrictions. You just got to work with a self-directed custodian who allows you to do this. And to do this, you're going to have to go away from your big guys, your Fidelities, your Merrill Lynch, you know, all those guys. They're not going to allow you to invest in real assets like, like rental properties. But you can work with a specific niche 
self-directed IRA custodian that allows you to do things like investing in rental properties, allows you to uh, do private lending, which is another thing I'm a huge proponent of. Um, and there's no restrictions and you can get financing as well. So a whole lot of opportunities for you if you have money in your company 401k or you have it in an IRA, a Roth IRA, a solo 401k, you can really tap into that capital and allow you to start building your rental property portfolio as well as diversifying. Outstanding. And Greg, I got good news, man. I hadn't been checking in on the Facebook group, but Bill is with us in the Facebook group. So Bill, I knew you were going to join me, man. He was sending me messages. He told me, and if Bill says he's going to do something, I know he's going to do it. He's, he's well, a Gator fan. I mean, that's what I would expect. There you go. Good news. He also put in the, in the Facebook group, you have all my retirement business. I just got to get started. So Bill, <laughs> I would recommend go to chat with jwb.com. That's a, that's a great way to get started or go to the JWB web class and get the toolkit if you don't have that yet. But those are the, those are the best ways to get started. Uh, last question today, Greg, you ready? Yeah. All right. It's from my buddy, from my buddy, Ben Jimenez, who's been, who's been piping in here, man. I really appreciate it, Ben. And he signs Ben J. Ben, I'm going to call you Ben J because you keep signing it that way. But I like saying Jimenez because I feel like I'm back in Miami, my roots. I know a bunch of Ben Jimenez's. So anyways, Ben J asks, concerning holding your property for long term is a good thing. But at what year are you no longer allowed to depreciate? Is it not? Okay, sorry, I messed this up. Ben J asks, Concerning holding your property for long term is a good thing, but at what year are you no longer allowed to depreciate? Is it not after 20 years? This is a tax question, is what he writes, which I know makes your face light up, and it just did. It does. It does. I like all the tax questions that I have the answers for. None of the tax questions that I don't have the answers for, which is a lot of those. <laughs> but this is one that I do have the answers for. So there's not a limit to when you can, a number of years after when you can depreciate. There are, there's a generally accepted depreciation schedule for your rental properties. And so what the IRS and what is generally accepted is to depreciate your properties over 27 and a half years. So what the IRS allows you to do is to calculate the building value of your asset, divide that by 27 and a half, and to take that as an expense every single year. This should light up everybody's tax saving eyes right here because when you can take that expense, that might be 3,000 or maybe 4,000 or maybe $5,000, you can take that as an expense which would offset positive cash flow in that year. And that allows you to have, in essence, a tax deferred strategy with your rental income, which is incredible. So to answer your question directly, there's not a limit to the year that you can take the depreciation. Generally speaking, most people are going to depreciate the property over 27 and a half years. Um, and you know, there are ways to get more aggressive and to, to limit the number of years that it takes to depreciate that would be a good thing because that means you get a bigger write-off every single year. Um, but it, there's not a hard and fast like limit to the number of years. Awesome. I'm going to read off a couple kind of cool comments that I've been rolling in here from Leo. He put it uh, in the chat. He puts, I did a loan on my 401k property on, on my 401k from a company and bought a rental property in Las Vegas last year. And we'll be doing the same process this year and most likely buying turnkey property from JWB. So that's awesome. Sounds Leo. Incredible. Yeah, Congratulations, man. Leo. Anthony Dita in the, or Dita in the Facebook group says, Hey guys, just received the list yesterday for, of properties from Mike looking for number four. Awesome, Anthony. Congratulations. Anthony's been, been there in the watch party. I know he's been on the show a few times. He's a relatively newer client and we're just super to have you have, uh, have your trust and have you on the show, man. Maybe we should, if he's going for number four, maybe number four is uh, when we bring him on as a guest and talk to Anthony up here on the, on the Not Your Average Investor show. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. And Anthony, not many people know this, but when he gets to number five, I'm sure he knows this, but when you get, when you get to five properties with JWB, we drop your management fees from 10% each month to 9% each month. So he's getting close there. Boom. Boom. I love it. And then Marilyn has a, a, final, a final thing here before we close out, Greg. I know I promised to get you out at 115. This is the best I've ever done, though. We're going to get you out of here before 120. <laughs> Marilyn I'm says- gonna another, I'm going to throw another topic on you. So I'm going to work against getting away from uh, getting out of here at 115. Yeah, so. man, I'm in trouble. All right. Marilyn Cotterman says, due to COVID, I was able to take money out of a low interest bearing CD without any penalty or fee and did private lending with JWB. Not sure if that's still available. 
That's incredible. Yes, private lending is still available. And so we, we pay 10% interest to our private lenders. So what Marilyn's talking about there is she was probably earning, I'm going to say next to nothing with that low interest CD that she had. She was able to take that away and then earn 10% on that money. And just incredible. I'm so happy for you, Marilyn. That's a, it's a great move. Yeah, man. All right. What are you, what are you, what, what are you throwing on me, Greg? What's going well, on? Well, you know, I would be remiss if we did not talk about something that Bill Oxley was asking about the old federal reserve building. Remember he was asking about us to break down the numbers on it. That's right. That's right. I messed yeah. it up. Yeah. So let's yeah. do this for Bill. So, okay. you know, I posted some really exciting news for JWB and for downtown Jacksonville. It was JWB's second purchase of a downtown building in the heart of downtown Jacksonville. And um, it's a pretty big purchase. And, you know, Bill asked me to break down the numbers of the purchase and to kind of talk about what that building is. And Pablo, do you want to, I don't know if you could kind of in the background, maybe pull up the, the article so people can see this building. The cool thing about this building is that for most of my life here at JWB, when we buy something, it looks like garbage. <laughs> it looks d dilapidated or it is beat up, right? We take you know, distressed assets, and then we turn them into really beautiful cash flow performing assets, right? So what you'll see is Pablo, you know, finds this, this article that was written about us in the paper, you're going to see this building that we just purchased in downtown Jacksonville. And I hope I'm not overselling it, but it's beautiful. It's the old Federal Reserve building, which is right across the street from City Hall in Jacksonville. And uh, it's just a, it's a beautiful building. Now it's a shell, because there's nothing on the inside, because it has not, it's, there's, there has been nothing going on with it for, for many, many years. Um, but it's, it's a really cool building and um, quite a big deal for JWB, quite a big deal for downtown Jacksonville and part of this momentum of downtown that we've been talking about for many, many months here. So yeah, so look at this building here. How cool is that? It's gorgeous, man. You know, there's I oversell a- it? No, man, I think it's awesome. I, when I saw this go through, there's this like building in downtown Miami that was a bank and they turned like the vault and the, and the area into this event space that ended up being the best event space in, in Miami. It's, I'm, I'm blanking out on the name, but I saw this and I immediately was like, oh, I love this. This is super cool. Yep. And that's so th what this building will become is mixed use. So it will be a combination of restaurant, office, and there will be some event space. And I've been inside this building. It is so like you walk in and you just can't help but see the potential for event space or restaurant or how cool it would be to have your office, uh, you know, in that building. So that's what that will become. We bought the building for $1.75 million and Bill asked, how did we do it? Well, I thought this would be another cool kind of little learning lesson as well. So the way that we put the deal together is we did something called seller financing with uh, the seller. Um, so seller financing is where you basically ask the, the previous seller to become the bank for you. And, you know, JWB, of course, purchased the property, but we have a note to pay to that seller. And this is more common on commercial uh, real estate. It's, it's much more common than residential, but this might be a way for all of you who are investing in real estate to, to think of ways to raise the money. You know, Paul, you've heard me say many times, the money problem is the easiest part of the problem to solve. There's a million ways that we can raise capital. And most of the time it's just in between your head is the reason why you haven't been able to raise it. So seller financing can be one of those ways. Now, before somebody asks me, can we buy properties with JWB through seller financing? You can't, we don't do that. <laughs> but I guarantee you there's ways that we can help you raise the capital uh, in other ways. So what we did here is a $1.75 million purchase, $800,000 of that purchase is in seller financing. So the seller basically has an agreement with JWB that we need to pay off that $800,000 loan to that seller. And the first year we have uh, an interest rate to pay and then that interest rate accelerates and we have to pay it off in three years. So we have three years to turn this building into what we expect it will become. And then ultimately we'll refinance out of this property pay the seller back that $800,000. And that is how we'll be able to do this deal um, as far as that seller financing component. Very interesting. Very interesting. So then, so then you're looking at a, so the window of making this a cash flowing asset to then pay that off is, is very defined and you are 
banking on this thing based on operational prowess? Well, I say three years and that might concern some people and say, oh, geez, you have to renovate a huge project like that in three years and all this other stuff. For us, the, definitely that is the plan and we expect to do that. Um, it's not like this whole thing falls apart if for some reason it takes a little bit longer to refinance out. Um, you know, like for example, there's a lot of other financing sources that we have. And so that would just be the most advantageous because you can take an asset that's not performing now where we have the seller financing, the, the seller is financing us. And then once we turn this into that event space and that, you know, retail and that, um, you know, the restaurant and the office space, and we have tenants in place, then you can go to a big bank. And when you go to a big bank and they see a performing asset and it looks wonderful and it, the appraisal makes sense, then you can then get really inexpensive debt at that point. Cash out the previous seller, get really inexpensive debt at that point, And that's, that's the ultimate best play for us. Very cool. I'm also be remiss not to mention the fact that you are now, you know, living your principles of clustering. You're buying stuff in downtown. There's also a little, little known fact that there is this urban trail that's coming to Jacksonville called the Emerald Trail, which spoiler alert, we have a land use attorney who's an expert in the ROI on urban trails coming in a couple of weeks, Steve Warnick, uh, an old friend of mine from Miami as well. And uh, next week we have your buddy, Rusty, right? Rusty is a leadership expert that's going to be talking about leadership through crisis. We're all navigating one crisis or another in our business, in our home, coronavirus, everything that's going on. He's an expert in this stuff. He's going to give us a real peek behind the curtain of why JWB's business works so well, even in crisis situation, why tenants stay with them, stuff like that. I think it's going to be super, super instructional. And I know that you speak really highly of him, right, Greg? Rusty's the man. Rusty has known JWB in some of our best times and in some of our most challenging times. And he's been there with us to help us navigate it. So if you are thinking about how best to navigate your real estate business, and you want to talk to the guy who consulted JWB on how we've done it and have continued to really thrive in the face of some pretty severe challenges, namely COVID, namely other challenges in the real estate market that we've seen, it's because of the, the teachings uh, of Rusty Busman. So Rusty's going to be on. I'm super excited. Um, and then as far as our, you know, Steve coming on and talking about urban planning and then the Emerald Trail, which is something we'll talk a lot more. You're starting to see what JWB has been talking about and what others in downtown Jacksonville have been talking about for a long time. It really is happening as far as developers coming in and making big, significant investments. So right next door to the Federal Reserve Building, which we just purchased, is something that we all know, love, know and love here in Jacksonville downtown. It's Sweet Pete's. Sweet Pete's is our candy shop, ice cream shop. It's beloved here in downtown Jacksonville. It was featured on um, the, the MSNBC show, The Profit. The Profit. And uh, so we bought that building, which is directly next door to the downtown, the old Federal Reserve building. So you're starting to kind of get a peek into JWB's vision for where we see this cluster happening of activity. And there's a lot of other really great news that's happening specifically around there in the form of apartments, um, in the form of retail. Uh, and when you can get, get that mixed use element into an area, a relatively small area, that's when you, things, you see things start to pop. So we're gonna kind of unveil that to you guys. And, the, and really it's gonna be kind of a months long. You're gonna kind of see some really positive things happening, but you're starting to see some of the dominoes fall right now. Dude, I'm so excited for it. I, I, I'm a big fan of urban, walkable downtown areas. And, I've, and I saw it the moment I landed in Jacksonville, what the potential is and the fact that I'm going to get to witness it from the inside with JWB, I think is really, really cool. I want to thank everybody for being here today. Thursdays are awesome. As you can tell, you know, we don't get this amount of questions on Tuesdays, right? Like this was so good. The show just like told itself because everybody was asking great questions. Everybody was engaged. Really appreciate having you take out time of your day on a Thursday, hang out with me and the grand Puba, Greg Cohen over here. And uh, I just really, really, I'm appreciative. Next step, if you don't have that, if you don't have that investor toolkit, go to jwbwebclass.com. Highly recommend it. It's going to be fantastic. And I will leave it up for Greg to uh, send us away.
Another great one, Pablo. I think everything you said there is spot on. I love everybody's uh, involvement in the group. It just makes so much, makes it so much fun for both of us and hopefully for all of you out there. So I'm excited about next Tuesday's show. I hope you guys will join me. And uh, until then, I'll, I'll catch you in the Facebook group. Thank you, everybody. All right. See ya.